Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element gold. As usual, I have a sample of it right here in a vial. You can see this is actually a sample of uh, gold leaf. We'll see more of that coming up. Back to our slides. To make it more visible, I put it on my scanner. Uh, let's magnify it a bit so you can see it better. Again, as I mentioned, this is a sample of gold leaf. Not much gold in there, probably about a penny's worth. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Gold is the 79th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 79 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. Gold was one of 11 or so elements discovered prehistorically, well before the invention of the written word. So I can't detail its discovery, but can illustrate a few of the places where gold shows up early on. One of the earliest places discovered so far where we find gold worked into various forms is in the necropolis of Varna, Bulgaria. This site, discovered accidentally in October 1972 in an industrial section of the city, yielded over 600 artifacts, some of them gold, dating from 4600 to 4200 BCE, over 6,000 years ago. Almost one-third of the graves in the necropolis have yet to be excavated. 3,000 years later, we find the exquisite gold art pieces made in ancient Egypt. This, of course, is the famous gold burial mask of Tut Ankhamun, but gold was used in the Middle East at least 2,000 years earlier. One of the earliest geological maps, the Turin Papyrus map, shows the plan of a gold mine in Nubia and some of the local geology. Nubia is now southern Egypt and northern Sudan. It's believed to have been drawn in 1150 BCE. Platinum and gold were used by the Tumaco La Tolita culture almost 1,000 years later than the Egyptians. Here's an example of exquisite gold and platinum jewelry. They resided in northern Ecuador and southern Colombia along the coast. Of course, in the Bible, there are numerous references to gold. The golden calf, the golden altar, the three wise guys bringing gifts of gold, silver, frankincense, and myrrh to some baby, streets made of pure gold, and so on. And, of course, the story out of Greece of King Midas, who could turn anything he touched into pure gold tragically, including his unfortunate daughter, and the almost infinite line of products to follow, including watches, perfume, and, of course, mufflers. The word gold comes down to us from Proto-Germanic languages, and we still use that name today for the element. The Latin word for gold, aurum, gives us the chemical symbol, AU. Gold is considered a member of the noble metals group of elements. These are more chemically resistant to corrosion and can often be found in their metallic form in nature. Gold is so chemically resistant it can only be dissolved in a hot solution of aqua regia, a mixture of hydrochloric and nitric acid. Here, you see 100 grams of gold go into solution. This is an expensive experiment to perform. Gold is also part of a large group in the middle of the periodic table called the transition metals. 
This section of the periodic table is where we fill the d electron orbital of the respective atoms as we move from left to right across the periodic table. Most of the time when we think of finding gold out in the natural environment, we think of it like this, as gold nuggets. And indeed, gold can be found like this, but it's rare. Normally, you have to go out and pan for gold, which means finding a good spot and working hard all day. Your reward for a day's work may look more like this, a few flakes of native gold from many buckets of dirt. This is uh, more of a hobby than a profitable occupation. These are very small crystals of gold formed from a gold vapor, so they're very pure. While not technically native, they're artificially made, I'm including them here. The interesting thing with these is you get to see the actual crystals of gold. While many of us imagine gold ore looking like this beautiful sample of native gold in quartz, or even this, where native gold is still visible, it more often looks like this, with no visible native gold at all. To make it commercially feasible, ore must have at least 10 parts per million of gold. That means you need to process a ton of ore to get less than a third of a troy ounce, or 10 grams, of gold. Speaking of which, the troy ounce is one of the last vestiges of a system for measuring weight dating back many centuries. It's used only for measuring precious metals today. When you see a quote for the price of gold at $2,100 per ounce, or for silver at $25 per ounce, we're talking troy ounces. Originally, it's believed, in France, the troy ounce was the equivalent of 480 grains of barley. They must have had some very standardized species of barley. In this system, there are 12 troy ounces per troy pound. To give us a basis for comparison, let's just convert to the metric system. There are 31.1 grams in one troy ounce. In the U.S., we still use an ounce-pound system too, but we use the avoirdupois ounce. Each avoirdupois ounce is 28.35 grams, and there are 16 avoirdupois ounces in the pound we're all familiar with. So, you see, the troy ounce is about 9.7% heavier than the avoirdupois, or standard ounce. Since there are 16 standard ounces per pound at 28.35 grams, and 12 troy ounces per troy pound at 31.1 grams, I calculate the troy and avoirdupois pounds to contain the following number of grams. So that old riddle, what weighs heavier, a pound of gold or a pound of feathers, can be easily answered as an avoirdupois pound of feathers weighing 453.6 grams. The pound of gold, the troy pound of gold, weighs 80.4 grams less, 21% less. However, an ounce of gold weighs more than an ounce of feathers. Can't we just all use the metric system? There is a mineral that looks a lot like gold, but is far, far less valuable. That mineral is iron pyrite, often called fool's gold. These beautiful crystals are iron sulfide, or FES2, no gold at all. The world, and I mean the entire world as you can see, produces around 3,400 metric tons, or 3.4 million kilograms of gold annually. Sounds like a lot, but that amount of gold would be a cube, 5.61 meters, or 18.4 feet across. Let me put a person in there for comparison. Well, maybe that is a lot of gold. The largest producer of gold, 
about 11% of the world's supply, is mined in China. Russia produces about 9.5% of the world's supply, and Australia about 9.2%. Many other countries mine gold, as you can see here. That other slice from the rest of the world is about 19%. That's a total of around $228 billion worth per year. This is a very interesting visualization of gold production by country over the past 200 years from the visualcapitalist.com website. It's worth downloading and poring over for some time. Generally speaking, we're pulling more out of the ground now than we ever have. Gold is pretty pricey stuff. 99.99% .99 pure gold will currently, in April 2024, run you about $2,000 per troy ounce, or about $65,000 per kilogram. That's a historical high, as we'll see in the next slide. Here is the historical price of gold since 1791 in dollars per troy ounce, averaged out over a complete year. This story is really interesting. World governments fixed the price of gold and issued paper certificates representing the value of that gold held in reserve. In the early 1900s, as various economic crises made fixing the price impractical, not even governmental pressures could keep the price constant. In 1971, the U.S. abandoned the gold standard completely as it could no longer back our paper currency with precious metal held in its vaults. Starting in 1971, the value of gold has been at the whim of the free market. For instance, in 1980, high inflation because of strong oil prices, Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, and the impact of the Iranian Revolution caused the price of gold to spike. While this chart only shows gold's value until 2023, the current value of gold, as of the making of this video, is above $2,200 per troy ounce, a record high and off this chart. This is a gold certificate issued by the U.S. government back when our money was actually backed by the precious metal. The certificate promises its value, quote, $20 in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. Well, that's no longer the case. Incidentally, the largest storehouse of our nation's gold is in this building in Fort Knox, Kentucky officially known as the United States Bullion Depository. It purportedly contains 147.3 million troy ounces of gold. At today's price, the gold in Fort Knox is worth about $319 billion. You can understand why we're no longer on the gold standard when the government last year, in 2023, spent $6.2 trillion, 20 times the amount in the vault. The element gold is one of the rarer we've dealt with so far, coming in as the 68th most abundant element in the universe by mass, only six parts per 10 billion. Almost twice as abundant in the sun, it makes up one part per billion of its mass and is the 59th most abundant element there. It's the 41st most abundant element in meteorites at 3.4 parts per 10 million. Very uncommon in the crust of the Earth, it's the 62nd most common element at 3.1 parts per 100 million. Gold is also very rare in the oceans of the Earth. Its concentration is only 10 to 30 parts per quadrillion, or about 10 to 30 grams per cubic kilometer of water, a maximum of one troy ounce per cubic kilometer. While there's a lot of cubic kilometers of seawater, and hence a lot of gold in the oceans, no matter what any snake oil salesman tells you, there's no way to remove that gold economically, at least right now. Lastly, and unexpectedly, there's one part per 10 million of gold in us, the 28th most abundant element in our bodies. We'll talk more about this near the end of the presentation.
This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Gold is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at just gold a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang to now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of gold created by various processes relative to the sun. The curves are low because gold is underproduced in the sun. Less than one-third of the gold present today is believed to be produced by dying low-mass stars, the magenta area. Another third is produced in supernovae, the yellow area, and a small but significant portion, that green area on the top, is produced in neutron star mergers. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 79 protons for gold, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 37 known isotopes of gold, and of these 37, there's only one stable, non-radioactive isotope, gold-197. Gold is therefore a monoisotopic element. There are 23 of those, by the way. Gold-197 makes up all of the naturally occurring gold in the universe. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek, isos meaning same or equal, and topos meaning place, since all these various forms of gold occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of gold, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. More on half-life in the next slide. The isotope of gold with the longest half-life is gold-195, with a half-life of only 186.098 days. Unlike many of the elements we've seen so far, there are no really long-lived isotopes of gold. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide. I chose 1,024 atoms because it's a power of 2, and we'll be doing a lot of divisions by 2. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, Half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, Notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your lone remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Gold is dense stuff at 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up more densities for you too. You can see gold is a tiny bit more dense than tungsten, and if you've ever had a chance to lift a brick of tungsten, like the one you see here with me, you'd be shocked at the weight. That small brick weighs over 60 pounds, more than one-third of what I weigh. So would a similarly sized block of gold. So those old train robbery movies of thieves slinging around bricks of gold like cheddar cheese just ain't so. Gold is dense and heavy.
Even though we find gold on the surface of the Earth, gold is so dense that most of the element probably resides in the core of our planet, having sunk there while the Earth was still solidifying. The core of the Earth is probably a treasure house of dense and valuable elements, with no way for us to access them. Density measurement and gold brings us to the story of Archimedes. The king of Syracuse commissioned the making of a crown. He gave the appropriate and known amount of gold to a smith for the task. The king was suspicious that the smith had not used all the gold and had added other metals to form an alloy, keeping the extra gold for himself. One way to determine this would be to measure the density of the crown to see if it was pure gold, alloys being less dense. To measure the density, one would need to measure the volume and the weight of the crown, but the king had no way to measure the volume of an irregular object. He assigned the task to Archimedes. While pondering the problem in a public bath, Archimedes noticed water spilling over the edge of a full tub as he stepped into the water. He realized that the amount of water spilled must equal his volume. He could measure the volume of an irregular object. He is reported to have leapt out of the tub, running naked through the streets of Syracuse, exclaiming, Eureka! I found it. The crown was found to have been alloyed with other metals, and the smith was allegedly dealt with by the king. By the way, this sculpture of Archimedes is located at Madatek, Israel's National Museum of Science, Technology, and Space in Haifa, Israel. The word Eureka is found at the top of the Great Seal of the State of California, the Golden State, commemorating the 1848 discovery of gold, starting the California Gold Rush. There's also a gold miner, complete with a rocker, gold pan, and shovel on the left side of the seal. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself in my live talks. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, gold's density is 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle, the seventh highest density of all the elements. Its density is almost the same as tungsten. Wouldn't it be great to have a cube of this stuff? Unfortunately, at its current cost, that cube would be over $235,000. Any gold refiners out there? I'm open to the donation of a two and a quarter inch cube of gold if you're so inclined to add to my collection. This palm sized cube would weigh 3.6 kilograms or eight pounds, almost exactly what my tungsten cube weighs. Gold has the 44th highest melting point of the elements at a middling 1,064 degrees Celsius, or 1,947 degrees Fahrenheit. Gold boils at 2,856 degrees Celsius, or 5,173 degrees Fahrenheit, giving it the 40th highest boiling point of all the elements. That's 1,792 degrees Celsius above its melting point. Gold has the 34th largest liquid temperature range of all the elements. One of the subscribers to this channel, SillySad3198, thought it might be nice to see a graph of liquid temperature ranges from highest to lowest. So here it is. The widest liquid temperature range is of Neptunium at 3,356 degrees Celsius, all the way down to Neon, which is liquid only in a 2.51 degrees Celsius range. Again, gold has the 34th widest liquid temperature range at 2,057 degrees Celsius. Notice, 
All the noble gases, and hydrogen, have a very small liquid temperature range. If we compare the size of the gold atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The gold atom is about three and a third times the size of hydrogen. Here's the electron structure. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are seriously small. Looking at all the element atom sizes, here we see them sorted from largest, cesium at the top left, to the smallest, helium at the bottom right. Gold has the 36th largest size atom of the elements. Pure gold is pretty soft stuff, coming in at 2.5 on Mohs scale of hardness. It's one of the softer metals, though there are a few softer ones above it in the chart. It's only slightly harder than your fingernail, but definitely softer than your teeth, which may account for those characters in old pirate movies biting gold coins to test their hardness for authenticity. This is a chart of element hardness from hardest, boron on the left, to softest, cesium on the right, obviously not including liquids or gases. Gold is the 34th hardest element and the 33rd softest element, right about in the middle. Gold has the 21st lowest rate of thermal expansion of all the elements, only 14.2 parts per million per Celsius degree. This means if you had a one meter long bar of gold and you heated it by one degree Celsius, it would get longer by only 14.2 millionths of a meter, about half the diameter of a human hair, a middling expansion rate. Gold is the third most electrically conductive element, beat out only by copper, and silver. Making wires for your house, while efficient, may be a bit costly. Gold is also the third most thermally conductive element, also beat out by copper and silver. Electrical and thermal conductivity often follow each other because they both have to do with how the outer electrons are attached to their atoms. You'll probably remember that copper, silver, and gold are members of the same group in the periodic table, and hence share some common properties. One place where gold really shines, pun intended, is its ductility and malleability. Gold is the most ductile and malleable of all the elements. Ductility and malleability are related, but sort of opposite qualities. Ductility is the ability to deform under tension or stretching forces. Gold is so ductile that a single ounce of gold can be drawn into a wire 40 miles long. We'll see this wire again in a bit. Malleability is the ability to deform under compressive forces like hammering. A rice grain sized piece of gold can be laboriously hammered into a sheet with an area of one square meter. That's malleability. We call these ultra thin sheets gold leaf. They're so thin, they're about one tenth of one millionth of a meter thick. That's only 250 atoms thick, or should I say thin. This is so thin that a bit of light passes straight through it. I encourage you to explore the many videos on the internet showing the process of making gold leaf. In spite of the difficulty of handling it, gold leaf is used to decorate many objects. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. If you excite gold atoms, they give off specific colors of light. Gold has a moderately simple set of emission lines across the spectrum. If I increase the contrast to remove the background, you can see these colors more plainly. These emission colors uniquely identify the element as gold to scientists. No other element gives off this set of colors. Let's take a look at a few applications of gold. There are so many of these that I'll only be able to scratch the surface, 
though I'll try to give you some of the more interesting ones. Gold is used for many things, but by far most gold, 46% is used in the making of jewelry. Then, as we see, 23% is held by the banking industry. 16% end up as gold bars, which I assume are held as private investments for the most part. 9% is struck into coins and metals. Only 5% is used in the electronics industry, and the remaining 1% is used for various other purposes. As we've just seen, the major place we find gold used is in the jewelry industry. Gold is extremely corrosion resistant and has a beautiful yellowish luster. Because of its ductility and malleability, it's easier to work gold into almost infinite varieties of shapes. Be it chains, bangles, rings, pendants, earrings, or others. It might be worth noting here that pure gold is considered too soft to be used for jewelry. Usually it's alloyed with other metals, mainly silver, to make it harder. The purity of the gold is measured in a unit called the carat, spelled with a K, distinct from the carat spelled with a C used for weighing diamonds and other gems. Pure gold is designated as 24 carat. Jewelry is often made from 18 karat gold, which means the metal contains 18 parts of gold and 6 parts of other metals by mass, or about 75% gold. Similar to its use in jewelry, the tips of fountain pens can be plated with gold and platinum to keep them from corroding. Those nibs spend the bulk of their lives soaking in ink, which would corrode many other metals. Of course, the platinum and gold also add to the physical and psychological value of the pen. Gold coins, uh, like this $5 gold piece, were minted from 90% gold, 10% other metals. That's about a 21.6 carat gold piece. This $5 gold coin is now worth about $600 to $700. Here's the actual size of that gold piece, as you can see right here. In 2020, the state-owned Swiss Mint issued a 3 mm eighth inch gold coin with Albert Einstein's face on it. It's the smallest gold coin in the world, with a face value of one quarter Swiss franc, or about 26 cents. Unfortunately, only 999 were made, and were sold for 199 francs, or about $70. It came with a special case and magnifying glass, so owners could see the famous physicist on its face. I tried, but was unable to obtain one. I just looked it up online. They're now going for $5,000. The many segments of the James Webb Space Telescope you see here being assembled are made of beryllium, and the silvery beryllium is coated with gold to reflect infrared light. Webb is an infrared telescope. Here you see the reflectance curve of gold. This graph runs from the ultraviolet through the infrared. The visible spectrum is here between 400 and 700 nanometers. Notice the very high reflectivity in the infrared, almost a perfect reflector. By the way, gold is the color we perceive because it only reflects about 35% of the bluish light that hits it. White light minus blue light is yellowish light. Inside of integrated circuit packages, the actual integrated circuit chips are connected to the outside world with gold bonding wires. Because of gold's ductility, it's easily drawn into these wires, which are thinner than a human hair. Notice the chip is glued to the gold-plated package with silver-containing conductive glue. This is for both thermal and electrical conductivity. Because of its electrical conductivity, electrical connectors are often plated with very thin layers of gold. On the bottom, you see an audio RCA Y connector, an integrated circuit socket with its pins plated gold, and a speaker connector spade lug, 
probably unnecessarily plated gold to appeal to audiophiles with money to spare. On the top, you see a computer memory module with its edge connector plated gold to assure good electrical contact with the corresponding socket. Much of this gold ends up being recycled eventually. You can make real gold paint by mixing flecks of gold, possibly from gold leaf, into a liquid base. This antique bottle of paint was, quote, for all ornamental gilding and decorative purposes. Put a piece of gold leaf in contact with a droplet of mercury, and the mercury eagerly gobbles up the gold, forming an amalgam. An amalgam is just an alloy containing mercury. Interestingly, this ability of mercury was used extensively in 19th century mining for extracting gold from crushed ore, and is now responsible for the major mercury pollution in California's rivers and estuaries to this day. By the way, if you haven't checked out Niall Red's YouTube channel, you should. He's done some very interesting gold experiments. Gold alloys are used in dentistry for crowns, bridges, and other dental fixtures due to their biocompatibility and resistance to corrosion. These alloys must be designed to expand and contract with heat and cold at the exact same rate as the teeth they cover. Otherwise, serious damage can result, as you can imagine. Here's a gold crown that I had, used to have in my mouth. Actually, the whole tooth with the gold crown. There's one gold alloy that's so unique, I must mention it. It was provided by my fellow element collector, Ethan Currens. When gold is mixed with aluminum, the result is an unusual purple alloy. This alloy is about 75% of 18 karat gold and 25% aluminum. There are apparently very few metals with this color. I'm sure the chemists and metallurgists out there will add to the comments below with other possible purple alloys. Note, the gold button on the left is ultra-pure gold, and you can see crystals formed within the metal as it cooled. Speaking of colors, if you divide gold into extremely fine particles, they stay in suspension in the liquid rather than settling out. This is called a colloidal suspension. Milk is also a colloidal suspension of fat in water. In the case of gold, you get a reddish liquid. I have a sample of that right here. Here's a sample of colloidal gold. Notice its red color. This colloidal gold is used to test for cerebrospinal syphilis by changing color. Pure gold is so inert, it's edible and can be used to decorate food as you see here. I've seen it on cakes and pastries but never on sushi. This slide is making me hungry. There's even a liqueur with flecks of gold leaf in it called Goldwasser, or gold water. It's flavored with cardamom, cloves, cinnamon, lavender, thyme, coriander, and juniper. Sounds revolting, if you ask me. This type of drink has apparently been around since the late 16th century, so someone must enjoy it. To help relieve some of the symptoms of arthritis, gold in a chemical form may be used either as an injectable called myocrisine or in an oral form called ridora. Both are brand names. These drugs don't cure arthritis, nor do they repair or correct existing joint deformities. They simply may provide relief from pain caused by joint swelling. It's not known why this works. An adult human body weighing 70 kilograms contains about 0.2 milligrams of gold, slightly over one penny worth. That means that the entire population of the earth contains about 1,600 kilograms of gold. It may help to maintain our joints, 
as well as facilitate the transmission of electrical signals throughout the body. Surprising it has such usage. Given its rarity, you'd think we would have evolved without its essential nature. There may be other biological applications of gold that are really beyond the scope of this talk. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about gold. Deep they delved for thee, yet deeper still thy dwelling in the earth's dark core. In the next program in this series, I'll examine the only metal that's liquid at room temperature, mercury. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about the element gold.